Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Doug Hoyt from Euler. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about some um, of a research topic that we've kind of been working on to uh, sort of strengthen the oracles. Uh, actually, uh, a lot of this um, is a, uh, related to complemented the previous talk by Connor there, so I, I think it's a good uh, arrangement here. Um, yeah. So. Um, First of all, let me just give a quick, you know, brief history of the on-chain pricing oracles as, as I see it. Um, you know, the, the very simplest thing you could do, right, is just read a price um, on the chain, right? Get a, a quote from Uniswap, how much does a token cost, and use that. Um, that uh, is horrendously insecure for a reason we'll talk about in a second. Um, uh, so there were some solutions developed to counter that, right? Uh, the first one um, was Uniswap 2 that I know of, um, and that, of course, introduced the TWAP, time-weighted average price. Um, so uh, that does help a lot. Um, there are some kind of small downsides about how the TWAP is actually done. It's uh, arithmetic mean instead of geometric, um, which was addressed uh, by Uniswap 3. But overall, it's quite, it's quite secure. It's a good solution. Um, so then Uniswap 3 came up with uh, um, an, an improvement. Um, sorry, I, I should mention also Uniswap 2 uh, was fairly impractical to use because it didn't actually store internally the, um, the, the snapshots, the, the accumulators, right? You had to ex store them uh, externally. Uh, Uniswap 3 addressed that by storing them in the observations array that Connor was talking about, right? Also, I, I call it a ring, ring buffer. Um, and that made it much more, more practical to use, okay? Um, however, and this is one of the downsides that I see it, it is fairly inefficient to use. It costs quite a bit of gas to query Uniswap 3. Um, uh, and keep in mind that I'm not, I'm not disrespecting Uniswap 3 at all. It's an excellent uh, protocol and we use it for pricing right now. Just trying to make some improvements uh, gas wise for it. So um, as I mentioned, just reading a price off of the chain is um, not a good thing, right? Um, because it can be easily manipulated in the context of uh, atomic transaction, right? So this is how the, the attack would basically work. Um, you, you know, start an atomic transaction as a smart contract, make a gigantic trade on, on the exchange to move the price, invoke a victim contract, which will then see that very wrong price, right? Um, and if it's like a lending protocol, it might issue a loan at that incorrect price. Um, and then uh, you, you know, get your funds or the loan or whatever, and then you make the opposite trade to move the exchange back and recover your funds to do that. Uh, uh, that. Um, and because it's an atomic transaction, no one can sneak in the middle there and, um, uh, and arbitrage you, right? Uh, and also, um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily need any upfront capital because you could use a flash loan, right? So that's why you don't want to just read a quote. Um, so time-weighted average price is uh, the S Uniswap 2 solution that came up with it, uh, that it was come up with. Um, and if you think about it conceptually, you can think of a big list where every second, you know, the smart contract wakes up and pushes the price onto, onto this big array, and then you just pay, take the average of the most uh, recent end prices. Of course, it's not implemented that way. It's implemented more efficiently. But that's the concept. Um, great thing, as Connor was mentioning, is that it's immune to these uh, atomic transaction attacks that I was um, referencing. Um, because, you know, zero seven seconds elapse within a block, like while a block is executing, okay? Um, and furthermore, yeah, the attacker has to hold a bad price for long enough to impact the average, right? So even if you could do it for, you know, two blocks, like you, uh, you, you um, hold the price uh, incorrectly for uh, two blocks, it still wouldn't necessarily be enough, depending on how long of your l larger averaging window is. So this is, uh, this is just kind of um, a demonstration, or description about how um, <coughs> two ac accumulators actually work, right? Uh, they're these numbers that are increasing every second, right, uh, by the current price. So it's a gigantic number that every second is getting added on a another gigantic number. So it grows quite large. But Ethereum can handle very large numbers, so it's okay, right? Um, so the idea is that uh, you have two of these accumulator snapshots, those big numbers, and you can subtract them, and then you basically get, uh, as I've drawn here, sort of the area under that, pr uh, that price curve, right? And then, of course, given the area, you just divide by the time to get the average price. So it's a very elegant solution. Um, however, uh, as has been mentioned, um, there are potentially attacks uh, related to using TWAPs. Um, number one, uh, if you can move the price a very large amount, you don't necessarily need to hold it that for that long, right? Um, if you can move the price up a bajillion percent, uh, then that will impact the average very quickly, potentially within the next block, make, uh, uh, you know, uh, making a vulnerability, right? So um, uh, that's, uh, that's a very big concern, okay? Um, uh, if you're doing it for one block, I, I think, yeah, I have a slide here. If you're doing it for um, one block, in other words, you manipulate the price on you know, the first block and then move it back at the very start of the second block, 
Um, that way you can you can reduce the uh, risk of being arbitraged. Okay. Um, also, miners have already also had this uh, capability for some time um, with uh, selfish mining, and there's d various different ways that you can implement a multiple block attack. Okay. Um, and especially concerning are some of the changes that are coming uh, to Ethereum with respect to proof of stake. Right. Uh, with proof of stake, potentially um, an attacker could get several different blocks uh, in a row, just they're issued it by the way that the proof of stake um, algorithm works. Um, and that way they could, uh, you know, schedule ahead of time that they want to do this multiple block attack. And there's not really much that could stop them. And there's other things like MEV boost that kind of uh, democratize this uh, uh, ability that miners have. So, uh, one of our concepts to sort of uh, address this is to look at medians, okay? Um, this, I think, is a kind of interesting uh, example of an image filter. Uh, it's, you know, some kind of um, corrupted data that has a whole bunch of little pixels that are either, like, you know, fully, fully white or fully black incorrectly. And those are, uh, you know, called impulses in image processing. Um, and if you, uh, one of the standard ways to fix up these images, remove this quote unquote salt and pepper noise, is to use a median filter, right? It just takes every pixel and replaces it by the median of its neighbors, right? Um, so that leads us to how we want to potentially handle price problems as well, right? If there's some um, improvement we can make there. So similarly to how we have a time weighted average price, we technically we want a time weighted median price, right? We, we want to be able to, like in an ideal world, what we would like to do is take uh, a look at the previous amount of time uh, and divide it up into, you know, s uh, little segments where each one is the, um, uh, the, its length is the amount of time that was spent at that price. And then um, uh, you have all these different segments. Uh, you would want to sort them um, by their price and then find the midpoint of that big long line, right? So that's, that's the, the conceptual weight that you would compute a uh, time weighted median price, okay? Um, uh, medians aren't necessarily perfect, but they have a lot of benefits, okay? Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. Um, <clears throat> what do we want to do for our new Oracle, okay? Since we're, we're, we're trying to uh, build this thing from scratch, we, we wanted to, you know, improve on uh, Uniswap 3 in some way, as many ways as possible. Um, <clears throat> first of all, there's obviously the median, right? We want to make it uh, so that a contract can get the median, time-weighted median price of, uh, of an asset. Uh, as I was explaining, right? Um, because it's believed that that will be better secure against, for example, attacks that come in proof of stake and so on. Um, however, there's some cases where you still would want to use a TWAP, so we also want to support computing the TWAP from the Oracle, okay? Um, and by the way, we support the geometric TWAP, not the arithmetic of Uniswap 2, which has various problems. Uh, and then finally, we want our um, gas efficiency to be as, as, as uh, good as possible, okay? Um, Uniswap 3 is, uh, Excellent, except that, uh, for example, in our protocol, often uh, more than half of the gas used to interact with our protocol is retrieving Uniswap prices. So it would be great if we could get that lower down, comparable to, like, for example, the chain link price, which is really just a, a single storage read from a contract, right? Um, and also, we want to be mindful about what the absolute worst case of this gas cost that could uh, could happen. Uh, the previous talk was talking about uh, mentioned uh, ticks and what they are. Um, that is, uh, that is a really great idea that Uniswap had, and we take it a tiny bit further even. We kind of um, uh, make even larger ticks, right? So uh, it reduces the price precision a little bit from, um, from Uniswap 3, but uh, it's, it's a pretty acceptable trade-off, uh, I believe. Um, th this is uh, also called quantization in, um, in signal processing as well, so that's what we call it. Uh, it basically puts uh, the prices to, to a 0.3% precision instead of the 0.01% of Uniswap. Um, and Chainlink, of course, has an effective precision of 1% because that's when the Oracle's updated. Um, the nice thing about this is that the prices will pack into two bytes of storage, unlike three bytes, which is what Uniswap 3 requires uh, for its ticks. Um, the other slight change we make is instead of using absolute timestamps like Uniswap 3, we use relative timestamps, right? So. Um, uh, that way we uh, can just record a small price difference, or sorry, small time difference from the previous update to the current update instead of a, a larger t absolute timestamp. <clears throat> and the great thing about this is that it also packs into two bytes as well. So that means that price and timestamp together are four bytes and, and, and we can pack eight of those into a 32 byte storage slot. Okay, that's um, pretty important for the efficiency of our Oracle. Um, as we were talking about, Uniswap uh, 3 keeps this um, in storage uh, 
array of observations is what it's called. Um, but I think of it as a ring buffer, okay? Um, because uh, uh, as you can see in the diagram here, um, whenever a record is too old, it'll get overwritten, right? So you can kind of think about there, there being a pointer in this ring that's going round and round, overwriting older oper um, observations, okay? Um, <coughs> This was an excellent um, innovation of Uniswap 3, which made it really practical to use the pricing system. The way that Uniswap 3 actually works to retrieve a price from the ring buffer is it uses binary search. Okay, so um, it it actually checks the first and the last to check some boundary conditions of the ring buffer, um, and then it starts to like subdivide, jump halfway into the ring buffer. Okay, is this one is this one the right age? No, I need to go back. Is this one the right age? Um, no, I need to go forward, and it narrows it down halfway, halfway, halfway until it finds the correct observation. Um, this is uh, very nice because it reduces the um, worst case amount of uh, records you need to read. Like you're never going to read all of the records, right? You're going to read log n records on average. Um, but uh, it, it has some other problems. So what we have done is a, a little bit of a trade off is that we um, change our um, Oracle to use simple linear search instead, okay? So we don't use accumulators at all. Instead we just uh, record, you know, this quantized price and the relative timestamp sequentially in the ring buffer, and then when we want to look up a record, we just uh, iterate backwards starting from the end, okay? And uh, this is where that optimization of where we'll be able to pack eight records into um, a single slot comes in, is because uh, each read of the ring buffer itself, each storage slot, gives us eight different records, right? Which uh, reduces the amount of storage we need to read. Um, so that's the, that's the concept. That's the, the theory of how this works. Uh, you know, to, before we actually wanted to, you know, discuss this and say whether we not, uh, we think it's good, we wanted to actually check to see, uh, if it is. So we created this simulation that compares our Oracle against Uniswap 3, all right? Um, and, uh, what we did was download all of the trading history for, um, for, uh, mainnet Ethereum for uh, some common pairs, and then we re replayed those into a test environment where we have our Oracle um, compared against uh, the Uniswap 3 Oracle, okay? Um, <clears throat> and this, this slide is just sort of a demonstration about, uh, like a, a, a depiction about what uh, is actually output from the Oracle, okay? Um, the, the, the blue line is the median that's being computed, okay? Um, and the, the green line is the TWAP that's computed by Uniswap 3, and the red line is the TWAP that's computed by our contract, by our Oracle. Those last two aren't identical because of the quantization I mentioned, right? So um, uh, the quantization introduces a small amount of error into our Oracle. But again, we think that trade-off is reasonable. So I, I think this is sort of a neat slide just because it shows, you know, that the median tracks pretty closely uh, the uh, TWAP as well, right? When they're the same window size. Um, yeah, you can see also that the, those little yellow squares are individual trades, right? So those are, you know, uh, about 30, 30, uh, minutes before the, um, the line starts to move, right? You can think of a T, uh, TWAPs and medians, uh, being a sort of a lagging indicator, okay? Based on the window size, all right? So that's, that, that's sort of a, an interesting little graph that we generated just to depict the, how the prices actually change. Um, our simulation, uh, as well as showing us the price and giving us some confidence that the price is being computed correctly, also will be able to compare, uh, also is able to compare the gas usage of, um, of the two oracles to compare. Uh, first of all, writes are nearly identical to Uniswap 3. Actually, um, in, s in some cases, because our pr precision is uh, larger quantized, it will do fewer, right? It won't actually need to update it if the price stays within the 0.3% uh, the, the quantized, whereas Uniswap would do an extra rate. But by and large, writes are identical to Uniswap 3. <coughs> so um, in the following slides that I'm going to show that uh, uh, show the gas usage, um, this is what's happening. Uniswap 3 is computing the TWAP, as it always does, uh, and our Oracle is computing the TWAP and the median together, okay? So um, this first example is kind of like just a, a random day I picked uh, for a very popular pair, USDC WAF, and um, <coughs> you see on the top there the, uh, the green uh, points are the gas usage of Uniswap 3, querying Uniswap 3, asking what is the 30 minute um, TWAP for this particular pair. Um, and I do a query after every trade and also every uh, five minutes or something like that. Um, so there's, you know, lots of samples. Uh, and then the exact same query is put to our Oracle, which is the, uh, which is the red points, right? So you can see it's uh, quite a bit lower um, in the typical case. Um, <clears throat> there's some interesting artifacts in these graphs that I probably don't necessarily have time to discuss all of them, but you can see that, uh, for example, there are some horizontal lines. Those uh, in, in, in the green um, 
in the green uh, points. I believe that that is the amount of steps that it needs to make to binary search the ring buffer. Each one of those lines is related to that in some way. Um, there's also a baseline line at the very bottom, uh, the, the red, that uh, indicates like the absolute best case scenario for our, our, our oracle. It's a single storage read. And that's especially stark if you look at the oracle results for like a stable, stable pair. This is a USDC die, 0.01% uh, pool. Um, in this case, uh, uh, the price never moves outside the 0 0.3 quantile in the uh, window. So uh, it's always just a single storage read to return the, uh, the record, the, the oracle result. Whereas Uniswap 3 um, still does the entire binary search of the ring buffer, okay? So in this case, uh, it's, it's extremely stark. Uh, here's just another example, like the, the great crypto crash of May 12th there. Um, uh, we did this, uh, it had some especially interesting results. Um, this is wrap Bitcoin wrapped Ethereum um, during the crash, right? So you can see that even at the, the peak of trading, uh, it, it's still quite reasonable and below Uniswap 3. However, and as I was talking about the worst case uh, situations, uh, this is what USDC West did during the crash, right? So here, actually Uniswap uh, had at some small periods of time was more efficient than our, um, than, our, uh, than our Oracle, which leads into the worst case analysis of the Oracle, okay? Um, but first of all, uh, there are a couple things that we can do to, um, to address this, right? Number one, uh, it may be the case, this is still being analyzed, but it may be the case that with median, you can shorten the window and maintain um, equivalent security, okay? And that uh, has a very uh, beneficial effect on the gas usage because the shorter window results in yet fewer um, records read from the ring buffer. Uh, as you can see here, this is the exact same as the previous worst case one, um, except we've shortened the window size to uh, 10 minutes instead of 30 minutes. So here you can see even during the, the great crypto crash of May 12th, uh, USDC WEF uh, reading from the shorter window size is more efficient than the Uniswap um, 3 uh, Oracle. <clears throat> So uh, that's the simulation. Um, at a high level, uh, we should consider where the gas actually goes. Like, what is the, what is the cost of these for our Oracle? Uh, there's two main cost centers. As I discussed, the first one is reading the ring buffer entries from storage. Uh, there's not too much we can do to minimize that with our design other than use shorter windows. <coughs> Excuse me, because, uh, <coughs> because as I said, it's already quite packed. Uh, however, the other gas uh, cost is actually computing the weighted median. And this is something I was especially interested in because um, the algorithm we use, quick select, I think I'll talk about that in a second, ha famously has um, worst case n squared um, uh, complexity. Okay? Um, so the following slides show the relative number, uh, cost of the relative number of entries loaded. Okay? And what you can think about this is if you have a window size, uh, this is the number of times that a block proceeds to the next block and there's more than a 0.3% price change within that window size, right? So typically this is a fairly small number, but it can get, it can get quite high, right? So here it is with a um, 30 minute uh, TWAT, which needs about 144 um, blocks, uh, sorry, like ring buffer entries on average. Um, here it is as each one of those has a price movement of 0.3%, okay? You can see uh, on the bottom is the absolute best case scenario. In fact, uh, here I've just deleted the code that computes the median, right? So this is just purely loading the ring buffer entries. <coughs> The uh, blue one is computing the median, but it's the absolute best case where it's already sorted in, in the right order. Um, and then the green one, I've randomly uh, moved the price around to uh, better like, illustrate typical costs. Um, so yeah, as I said, quick select is the algorithm that we're actually using to find the, uh, the, the median. Um, we're using you know, a very simple textbook implementation of it. Like it's you know, literally a computer science 101, well, mid-range computer science uh, exercise that's uh, to be implemented. Um, so we're not doing anything that fancy. <clears throat> and the nice thing about quick select is that it doesn't need to sort the entire array to find the median, right? Because you don't really care about the actual sorting on either side of it, you only want to find the one that overlaps the midpoint, right? Great thing about quick select is it runs in uh, ON in, in um, the average case. But famously, just like quick sort, if you give it the exact wrong input, you can get it to degrade to N squared, right? And that's because of how the pivot is selected in quick sort. <clears throat> Here's a depiction of that. Here is where you see, you know, uh, the absolute worst case. Um, in fact, I had to hack the code to like allow this to happen because normally um, the pivot's a little bit smarter. Um, but uh, here you give it like the wrongly sorted, like opposite, where everything is out of order, and uh, you can see that the gas usage spikes up really, really high. Right. So this is the, the worst case um, gas usage. Uh, so what can we do about that? Um, first of all, this is very, very unlikely to come up naturally, right? Just by typical um, situ uh, 
circumstances of trading. So uh, this would, I believe, only come up if there was an adversarial input. If someone is trying to deliberately create a token that causes gas price, uh, gas usage to spike up, and they might be doing that to prevent themselves from getting liquidated, for example, right? Um, uh, and this is one thing that um, I somewhat disagree with uh, about what Connor was saying about how it's better to uh, always fail back, the or, uh, f uh, sorry, like to um, fail, uh, it, uh, it's like one mitigation. That is sometimes useful, but not always, right? It's not, not necessarily always. Uh, for example, in our system, um, potentially if there was a failure reading a price, that could allow someone to like block their account and not, and prevent themselves from getting, getting liquidated. So it's a good mitigation in some situations, but not all. Um, so what I suggest to mitigate this N squared problem in particular is uh, to select the pivot index uh, randomly, right? To use a pseudo random number generator. Um, this is like the standard textbook way to prevent this as well. Um, the, the only th question is how do you choose the seed of the PRNG? Well, what I propose is you hash the message of sender and the previous block hash together and use that as the seed. Um, and the reason that uh, I have selected those two is that um, put including message of sender makes it so that you could, um, if you were trying to pull this attack off, you could only attack a single particular participant that was reading it, right? And uh, similarly, for the previous block hash would make it so that your, your malicious tokens, uh, all the work you've put into setting up this malicious input data would be invalidated on the following block. Um, so that's it.